setting aside, I'm certainly glad to be here today to address you. I've always enjoyed uh, speaking to the Rotary. And as we know, uh, many of us have been FaceTiming our friends and family long before COVID-19 struck. And uh, given COVID-19, how it's changed our lives, it's forced us to these virtual meetings. And I don't know about you, but I'm not sure when we're gonna be able to return to face-to-face -face meetings safely. So uh, I put together a list of topics and uh, for discussion, I think you'll find something in here for everyone. And so the first thing that I want to discuss on this list here is the COVID-19 and the city response. So as we all know, and can you all see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. As we all know, we have a number of uh, acts, orders, uh, laws that have been uh, passed recently, including the city of Oxford. Uh, Governor DeWine declared a state of emergency on March 9th, uh, 2020. I happened to be heading to Massachusetts to visit my daughter, her partner, and my granddaughter. So everything sort of fell to hell in a handbasket over that period of time. Uh, the legislature passed this COVID-19 response legislation, HB 197, and the governor signed it on March 27th uh, of 2020. And of course, as you know, there have been a number of federal laws that have been passed too. First and foremost was this Family First Coronavirus Response Act, which required employers, including the city, to basically expand the FMLA uh, provisions. We also had to expand sick leave, so on and so forth. So there was a lot of things that covered all of our employers here in Oxford, including the city of Oxford, which necessitated us to, to make many changes. So the next one was the federal law, which is the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, which is the CARES Act. And I'll talk more about that later. And of course, as you know, we've had several things that we've done here locally City Council adopted a face mask requirement ordinance on July 21st. And then they also adopted a mass gathering prohibition ordinance just at our last meeting, which was August 18th. So I wanted to share those things with you and I'm sure you might have some questions for me on those later. Uh, if you've been to our website, and I know that Jessica shared some things with you as well too when she spoke uh, several meetings ago, but we have on there a community COVID update. If you go to that section in our website, it's on the front page. You just click this logo and it'll take you right to it. It will share with you both the ordinances that, both ordinances that I talked about earlier, the face mask provision and the mass gathering. But it also has a COVID-19 concern, or shall we say, a, uh, where you can file a complaint. So we get quite a few of those, excuse me. Uh, I think we're now up to about 90, just under 100. Uh, folks have let us know when they see a party which has more than 10 people. Uh, they let us know when folks are not wearing their face masks, if businesses are not enforcing it. Uh, you know, I took many of those phone calls in the beginning uh, and uh, you know they're varied. We had one uh, lady who I think went around to every gas station to see if they were enforcing it. And I know several of them uh, were not aware of the passage of our ordinance and were not enforcing it. And we, and we obtained compliance. Now, I will tell you that a few of them basically said they didn't believe in it. And I basically said, well, I understand it's the law here in Oxford and everybody's safe. So if you haven't had a chance, I would suggest that you go to our website and take a look at the, this COVID uh, update page. Uh, we put some news articles in there as well, and it's very, very informative. We have links to uh, the Butler County Board of Health. We have links to the Ohio Department of Health, and we have links to the CDC website. So as we all know, there is a lot of information out there, and we want to keep everybody informed. So. You know, one thing we all need to do is learn to live with this disease. It's going to be with us for a while. And I know with this group, I'm sure you're all complying with our face mask ordinance and our limitation on mass gatherings. Everybody in our community to be a superhero if we're going to 
uh, defeat this and get back to anything close to normal. I mean, I think it's safe to say that well beyond the first uh, of the, or the end of this year, we're gonna be uh, dealing with this. And of course, now that our students are back here uh, on uh, campus, or excuse me, not on campus, off campus, uh, we have additional issues to deal with. And uh, we had at our last council meeting, uh, Dr. Brunell and uh, uh, another one of her associates come and address city council about the things that they're doing and how we're working together, both the city and the university. As we all know, our destinies are intertwined and certainly that is the case now. What we're trying our best to do is make sure that we don't end up having to close down our economy again and send the students home. You know, the hope is that on September 21st, they will have face-to-face uh, -face classes uh, rather than all online. And, and of course, I'm not a betting man, but given the recent news that we had with the uh, 27 student athletes testing positive, uh, I think it, might be doubtful that they go back to face-to-face -face classes. We'll see. We're not making that decision. Uh, that's a decision that the president and his staff will be making uh, for the university. But once again, we have a very good relationship. We speak frequently together. I shared with Betsy before we got started that we have a Oxford leadership group, which is composed of myself and the mayor, uh, Mike Everett from McCullough High Memorial Hospital, uh, we have uh, Ed Thoreau with the Talawanda School District. Uh, Ted Pickerel usually participates from Miami University and other uh, local partners and leaders that we have been having a uh, teleconference every Monday uh, to discuss issues and, and what's happening in our community. In fact, right before I uh, signed on to this meeting, Mike Everett called me to give me an update. So. A lot is going on, but you know, I just want to emphasize that we all need to do our part. I think it's important for us as older folks to uh, provide the role model for our students here who, of course, at their age, they're more concerned about socializing. And so this has been a real challenge for both the university and the city, and we're doing our best to deal with it. So a little bit on CARES Act funding. Uh, which I mentioned earlier, we received about $428,000 and we received this on July 16th. Uh, the funny part of this story is that we had to read about it in the newspaper before we knew what the amount was that we were going to receive. Uh, things are happening so quickly. And so we went ahead and passed a ordinance to set up a fund to receive these funds, even though we didn't know the amount. And we also passed a resolution allowing the city to accept those funds, things that were required by the federal government, federal and state government. So we did finally receive them on July 16th, which a little over a month ago. And then we just found out recently that we're gonna receive an additional $214,000. So, you know, given the guidelines that we received, we have expended some money. At our last council meeting, we purchased some electronic message boards so that we can let people know when they come to town about our mask and face mask ordinance, because folks in different states from other communities, and we want folks to know that we have these requirements. I was speaking to a couple from New York City uh, who was in town probably a couple weeks ago, and they weren't aware, aware of our face mask ordinance, and they didn't have one on. I said, look, I can't continue talking to you unless you put a face mask on. All I need is somebody to drive by and clip a picture of me and, you know, uh, wondering why I didn't, didn't say something. So they did have their face mask, pulled them out and put them on. We provided a grant to the senior center to replace their telephones. We purchased some laptop computers because early on, uh, we needed to let our workers, many of our workers work from home. Although a lot of the essential workers, fire, police, in my office still came in uh, to work here at our uh, offices. So uh, we did purchase some laptop computers. We purchased face masks and hand sanitizers for our use as well as uh, for other uh, community organizations as well. We, we purchased some plexiglass shields for our city counters and a few other things. So we, we spent approximately $49,000. We have about $370,000 remaining. And we are going to have a discussion item at our 
September 1st meeting with city council to discuss how we're gonna, what our plan is for this remaining funding. So we've generated a lot of ideas from staff, our community partners, and we'll be discussing that at our September 1st meeting. One thing we know for sure though, is that this money cannot be utilized for revenue shortfalls. And we estimate that we are probably gonna be about 10% short on general fund revenues, which is about a million dollars. But uh, fortunately for the city, we have been, uh, we have a, a pretty healthy a fund balance, which is helping us weather this storm. Forward. We learned our lesson in 2008, and so I would like to congratulate City Council and my staff for, uh, you know, we've, we've been pretty tight with our funding, uh, and, and we do have a pretty good uh, fund balance to weather this. But of course, no one knows how long this downturn in the economy is going to continue. We are so dependent on Miami University, they provide over half of our income tax revenue. So as I said earlier, I hear somebody is echo there. Hopefully it's not interfering with your hearing my comments. But one thing that I would be remiss if I did not mention during this time period is that uh, this issue of Black Lives Matter. And, you know, this has grabbed the nation's attention, certainly is uh, an issue for those communities that have had some recent uh, violence and some uh, killings of uh, black people. Uh, and, and so we've had that discussion here locally. One thing that you probably are aware of, but I just want to remind you that in 2015, we established a police community relations and review commission. It was established by ordinance by city council. So I believe we were somewhat ahead of the game in listening to our community uh, and, and responding to some of the concerns that they had. This is a seven member commission appointed by council. Their role is to improve communication between the city of Oxford police division and the community to increase police accountability and credibility with the public and to create a fair and impartial complaint process. We have not received uh, since then that many complaints, very, very few. Uh, you know, and I think that's indicative of the leadership I, that we have in our police department with, with Chief Jones and the fine officers, men and women that we have working for our police division. Uh, they have quarterly meetings and they had more recent meetings recently to deal with the concerns that the community has and that they brought to our attention. Uh, give you an idea of what we've discussed in some of the previous meetings, our use of force policy our body-worn camera policy, and certainly the type of data that we're collecting and reporting to the community. We've been at this for uh, this data for over a couple of years. And one of the things that they suggested last year was to begin collecting information on stop data by race. So it does take additional resources to do this, but we're gonna do our best because I think we're doing a good job, but I believe we all understand that we certainly don't wanna rest on our laurels and you know this is an important matter uh, for folks of color. I mean, I can share with you that uh, we have one member, Amber Franklin, who is a professor at Miami University, and she's been on the, the PCRRC for quite a while. Uh, I can't remember the exact time period that this happened, but it's been within the last year. She was walking and had someone yell a racial slur at her. You know, you would think, please, not in Oxford, but you know, we're not immune from these issues and certainly we want to address them. So I congratulate the uh, Police Community Relations and Review Commission for dealing with the issues that have been brought to our attention. And as I said before, we're not gonna rest on our laurels. We're gonna continue to look for ways to improve with the resources that we're given. So a couple of other things that I believe you might be interested in is, as you all know, we own a track of land and here's a little map of it. You have 737 going up and down, and of course you have Brookville Road at the top uh, going from one side to the other. So this is a, a little diagram of our uh, Western Knowles property. It's 47 acres. It's off of Oxford Riley Road. It's zone R1B, single family, medium density residential. We had a design charrette looking for different development options for this land. Uh, probably three, four months ago. And we've included that design charrette options. We've included that information 
in our RFP and we're asking uh, people that are interested, firms, uh, to keep that in mind when they submit their proposals. We're, we've set a floor, a minimum of uh, $23,000 per acre, which would mean that we would bring in a little over a million if we were able to sell all 47 acres. The minimum amount of land that we are willing to sell, no less than five acres, because it requires it to be subdivided, and there's some uh, infrastructure improvements that need to be made. And the proposals are due August 28, 2020. Uh, we know at least one housing developer is interested, and we have, I believe it's a Presbyterian church that look, is looking at developing some uh, units for elderly folks. So we're excited about this, and hopefully, uh, we'll be able to get some proposals. As Dan knows, we've been at this for quite a while. Another thing that I wanted to share with you that we're very excited about, you know, I try to end on a good note because when we talk about COVID-19, it tends to be a little gloomy. But we have been working on, as you all know, this Oxford area trail. And what you're seeing here is a picture of uh, phase two improvement. This is the trail that goes under the US 27 South Bridge, and this is the base pavement that's there. So phase two begins basically at the uh, uh, DeWitt Cabin parking lot on Miami property. It goes under 73, past our uh, water treatment plant, uh, and then ends up over at Pepper Park. So it's a, uh, quite a, a, a segment that's being completed. You should be able to walk that sometime in October. The contractor should be finished. So phase one took us from the Black Bridge over to the city park. And of course we have this segment on Miami's property, which is a coal ash uh, that goes by the DeWitt cabin. So that segment, this coal ash uh, will be uh, paid in our third phase. And the third phase will also include extending it uh, to the high school. So it's a wonderful trail, given the restrictions that we have in COVID-19. It's great to have a facility like this so you can get out and walk, practice social distancing, and enjoy Mother Nature. So we're excited about that. Phase two should be opening uh, sometime in October, and we'll be announcing that. One other thing, one last thing that I want to talk about uh, is the Census 2020. Uh, I'm sure all of you here, now if I were giving this meeting face to face, I would shame you all and ask you to hold your hands up if you've uh, completed the census, but I'm guessing for this group, all of you have done that. So it's real, real important. The deadline is now, I believe, uh, September the 30th. We have one month. And so this slide I put together to kind of show you what our response rates are as of August 24th. And you can see that uh, Ohio, Butler County are ahead of the US response rate, but the city of Oxford trails. But I wanted to break that down by what we call census tracts. So below Oxford are listed the five census tracts within the city. And you can see they range from a high of 65.8% uh, to a low of 76 And of course, it shouldn't come as a surprise, the 76 includes most of the uh, dormitories at Miami University where students are. Now, I believe that's way low because Miami University will be reporting data on an aggregate basis to the census and they haven't included that yet. But basically, you know, we wanna do everything we can to make sure we have a complete count. We've had a complete count census committee uh, working on this and we want to make sure that we get everyone counted. So it's very, very important. Not only does it deal with the uh, apportionment of congressional reps, but at the local level, it can deal with funding. For example, Pell Grants are determined based on a census and some other federal funding. So if you've not filled it out, please do. This year, there is a, an additional way to fill it out besides phone and mail you can get online and fill it out. And you should have received a postcard with a, a identifier that you enter so that you can enter your information online. But please check with your family and friends. And if you know of students, encourage them to fill it out. It's real simple. I believe there's only seven questions. As you know, it's kept confidential. 
and uh, it's real, real important that they that they fill it out. And of course, this is where you lived on April the first. So that's the challenge for us because, as we know, with the university closing down in mid March, most of the students went home. Many of the students went home, and so it's going to be a real challenge to capture those, especially seniors that didn't come back uh, to Oxford. Uh, so it's real, real important. And the last thing that I want to do, and I apologize for this, but I want to give another uh, shout out to our uh, gift card program. As you know, we established this small business stimulus program where the city took $200,000 and granted it to the Oxford Community Improvement Corporation to purchase gift cards from our pretty much all of our small businesses. And those gift cards are on sale. They're $10 in each. They make great gifts for family and friends. If you have restaurants or stores that you go to frequently, I would encourage you to get online. You can do it online or you can come to City Hall and purchase gift cards. I know I have several businesses that I typically go to to, to eat lunch or to take home food. And so uh, I just ask you to, to do that because with the money we get back, we're going to be able to help more small businesses. And as we all know, our small business community is vital and they're really, really struggling. Uh, we've done a few things such as the DORA designated outdoor refreshment area, which is turned off now with the students back. And we also had Red Brick Fridays as ways to help our local businesses. So Boy, this is a challenging time for all of us. I know we all can't wait for this to be over, but I, I think we can all agree it's not gonna happen anytime soon. So let's keep in mind our small businesses. And with that, hopefully I didn't rush through everything too fast. I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have.